help. If you've been floating around the D&D community for a while, there's a very good chance that you've heard of the podcast called Dungeons and Daddies, which, it is worth noting off the top, is not a BDSM podcast. You might have heard of it even if you aren't in the D&D community because it's founded by the same people that founded Rocket Jump and who created Video Game High School, which, if I may go on a brief tangent, fantastic show. If you haven't seen it, it's a great time. You'll have a blast. If you have seen it, it's worth another watch. Super nostalgic. Dungeons & Daddies ranks in the top 100 podcasts, according to Chartable, on Spotify in the United States. It's also in the top five improv podcasts on Apple in the United States. It's a, it's a pretty big deal for a podcast, as podcasts go, considering how many there are. It's especially a pretty big deal for a D&D podcast. It tends to get mentioned right behind the big boys of D&D, often alongside other shows like NADPOD, which we've talked about in the past, and is generally a favorite among people who listen to their D&D shows rather than watching them, because it's a podcast. And there's a reason for that. The reason is simply Dungeons & Daddies is one of the best D&D podcasts. But it's also one of the worst. Now, to clarify, we're going to be talking about the first season of Dungeons & Daddies. That is the only one I've seen. It is the one that they gained most of their popularity from. They are currently in the midst of doing a second season. I have not yet seen, listened to any of that. So if you're here to get a review or hear about the second season, that's not what we're talking about today. I have heard mixed reviews about the second season, so if you're thinking that I was gonna spill the praises of the first season and then absolutely slam on the second, that's not what this is. Totally fair for thinking that might be what I'm doing. Just a heads up, I'm not. So in that vein, this video is gonna contain a lot of spoilers for the first season of Dungeons and Daddies. I'm gonna go through a very small non-spoiler section first, and then when I say, hey, we're hitting the spoilers, if you're interested in listening to the show, Leaf. Dungeons and Daddies is fantastic. It's one of the funniest and most heartfelt pieces of media I've ever consumed. And boy did I consume it. I ripped through that thing. I listened to it so fast. Just gobbled it up. The characters, both the player characters and the non-player characters, are some of the most creative, relatable, funniest characters in, in fiction that I've ever seen. At least two of them are maybe in my top funniest characters ever books. I'd highly recommend it to you even if you have no knowledge of Dungeons and Dragons because I mean, they're very, very loosely playing Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, that's as far as I'm getting without being specific. So if you want to be spoiler free, now is the time to exit the video. Thank you so much. See you next time. Love you. So let's start with the good. What does Dungeons and Daddies do really well? The stuff that makes it, again, one of the best. Ron Stampler. Ron Stampler. Listen, I know Beth May and her character Ron Stampler get disproportionate amounts of love, but I do think it's justified, which I guess technically means it's not disproportionate, but I digress. Not only is Ron unbelievably funny from hiding in his own pants to wearing so many pants to wearing no pants, but somehow he's also one of the most emotional and growable characters I've ever seen. Ron's character arc is like no other, and it was truly fascinating to watch. And, above all, hilarious. Tell me you did not sob at Ron giving Rogue away, and I will not believe you. Anthony Birch. Unbelievably fantastic storyteller. The setups he was able to pull off were immaculate. I mean, the big bad being revealed as Ron's dad so late in the campaign without any sort of spoilers around it, someone guessing it, and it still feeling genuine and realistic and like he he would been there the whole time despite no not knowing who he was it, it, it was amazing willie stampler was one of the most realistically hateable bad guys in any piece of fiction i've seen the library so cool and perhaps the greatest character ever created scam likely i mean goaded I do also want to give a special shout out to Ashley Birch and her character, Mark Likely, because that arc with Ron and Mark and just the rest of the cast is also fantastic. Daryl Wilson, played by Matt Arnold, is such a fun play on a lot of classic dad stereotypes. Will Campos' as Henry Oak is corny and campy in all the right ways. And of course... Glenn Close, played by Freddie Wong, is another all-time great. Even if all he did in the whole campaign was the Goblin D's Nuts joke, he would have been fantastic. But he did so much more. If you were going to actually lie, you should have lied about something impressive. Goblins? I fucking eat goblins for breakfast. It doesn't matter. And then I turn to the dads with a big old smile on my face and I go, You mean Goblin on D's Nuts? <laughs> oh my god! Oh. So, 
Anthony sets up a fantastic story with a ton of memorable NPCs and great plot points. We have a cast that meshes well. They're very funny. They keep the plot moving, their characters grow. That's fantastic. That's everything you could want from a podcast in this category. What could possibly be wrong? It's both the best and the worst show, so what's going on here? Where are they missing? Well, the D&D. When I was first learning how to play D&D, I watched a lot of Critical Role, as I think a lot of people do, and part of the fun of that was knowing the rules enough that I thought I could make a judgment when someone from the cast of Critical Role tried to do something, and then it was fun to compare what I would have done with what Matt Mercer did in the session. So naturally, I carried that through to when I started listening to Dungeons and Daddies. I was thinking, oh, here's someone trying to do something, how would I rule that according to the Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition rule set? When I started listening to Dungeons and Daddies, it became very clear very quickly that Anthony and I never would have ruled stuff the same way. And at first, that was because I thought I had a different understanding of the rules than Anthony. And in many ways I do, because Anthony and the crew basically don't give a shit about the rules in the best way possible. Let me explain. When I'm playing D&D, if something doesn't make sense according to the rules, it simply can't happen. It doesn't happen. I say it can't happen or I explain why it's not possible, based on the rules of the game and the world that have been set up. In Dungeons and Daddies, if something A is creative, B is funny, C serves the story really well, it does not matter what the rules say. The rules will be thrown out the window in favor of creativity, in favor of a good bit, in favor of something that makes logical sense according to the rules of the real world. They still used the structure to a certain extent. They were still casting spells. They were still handing out magic items. It is Chekhov's gun. So it's got nine bullets, and you can either use them as bullets to shoot things, or you can shoot it into the air, and the smoke from Chekhov's gun will take the shape of something that is relevant to your current situation that will help you out. <laughs> I go back, I'm like, guys, this car is a Japanese make and model. <laughs> oh, the gas tank immediately God. goes to fuel. They were still leveling up, but basically from the first combat, which is where most of the more technical rules become important in D&D, it was clear that those rules were not going to play first fiddle. Now, I want to clarify something because I realize the way that I've structured this video is going to make it a little bit unclear. What I am saying is not that misinterpreting or ignoring rules is making Dungeons and Daddies a bad show. What it's making it bad at is playing D&D. But who cares? Rather than slowing everything down to ensure they get the rules right, they would keep rolling. They wouldn't break immersion. If something made sense to them, it would happen. So why do we care if they're getting the rules right? All of the 5th edition rules are also made up. All rules are made up. It's a game. They were ignoring them, and it worked. So is it a bad D&D show because it ignored the D&D rules? Yeah, sure. But it's not a bad show. In the little wrap-up episode after season 1 concluded, Anthony said that he wasn't really stoked on how the finale went, especially when compared to the mini-campaign they ran called At the Mountains of Dadness, which was using Call of Cthulhu instead of D&D 5th edition. And I haven't played Call of Cthulhu, I have read the rules. And from reading the rules, what I gather is that it's a bit of a softer system. It's a bit more rules light than D&D, if you can believe it. A lot of that has to do with the fact that if you are getting into combat in Call of Cthulhu, you, you're probably already dead because you're fighting Eldritch Horrors. So it's mostly just running away and figuring stuff out. And that meshed really, really well with the Dungeons and Daddies crew. Now, I wasn't able to listen to all of At the Mountains of Dadness, but from the first episode alone, it was clear that the rules were really benefiting the, the story and also how they were playing it. It meshed really well. And I think that might have contributed to the fact that it all went together nicely. And to be fair, the finale of the first season of Dungeons and Daddies, I thought, was fantastic. It was the same as the rest of the season in that, you know, they defeat the big bad without the rules of the game, but so what? They did it in a very fun way. They did it creatively, they did it succinctly, they did it satisfyingly. But I think where I got a little lost in terms of at least the finale was they had set up all these plans which had very little to do with the mechanics, the structure of 5th edition, so it was a little bit hard to track. Like, what is actually going on here? 
And it's something to know that if you are playing in a game where you're going to ignore rules when you want to, or interpret them a lot looser, you have to be okay with the fact that sometimes that structure is going to get a little bit wobbly. I mean, 5th edition is already a pretty rules light system. I personally don't think you need to remove a lot of rules or ignore a lot of rules. But if you can, and it works, and everyone's having fun, then there's no issue with it. The reason that a lot of shows flourish in the live play format is because the rules of the game form a structure. It's really easy to show character growth because your characters are literally leveling up. The dice and the stats hold the players and the characters accountable to the world around them. You can't just make a decision and have it automatically come into effect. Characters have defined backstories, defined traits, defined abilities. And having all of that written down and prepared makes it really easy to then focus on the improv, the comedy, the story, the role play. The simple fact is that the Dungeons and Daddies crew quickly realized that they weren't as reliant on that structure. Their chemistry was really good. They just needed the bare minimum of structure at all. They borrowed the Forgotten Realm setting, which I do not know how they got away with. I am surprised they haven't had the Pinkerton show up on their doorstep. They used the class tropes to build out their characters, and they used the classic mysterious big bad that is present in a lot of D&D games. And they were kind of off to the races. After all of that was prepared, that's kind of all they needed. And so adhering closely to the rules after all of that prep work wasn't necessary. They still achieved character growth, big laughs, huge moments. They just did it outside of the rules as they were written. So what's the point of all this? What can we learn from it? Well, the same thing you can learn from most good TTRPG content. If it's fun, that's all that matters. If you and your players are having fun at your table, it does not matter what rules you are using or how well you are sticking to them. And the other thing we can learn is that this is probably all one big scam. I just haven't been able to figure out how yet. Are you looking to up your jape game from juvenile jest to profitable pranks and fruitful flim flammery? Now you can by enrolling in Scam Likely School for Scammers! Whether you're a seasoned con man or a rank rube, you'll learn everything you need to know about shaking down sad sacks with my 10 week program! Just listen to some of my satisfied customers! My name is Ron F. Stampler. I am a businessman with a huge business doing big numbers every quarter at AOL keyword Ron.business and Scam likely impersonated my friend Glenn and stole approximately $3 million worth of jewelry from us. We were going to use that money to hire an army of mercenaries to help us save our kids, but now we can't because we don't have any of that money anymore. Specialize in all the following. Single level market, multiple level market, pyramid schemes, Ponzi schemes, pincer maneuvers, quick change scams, three card monty, the gold standard, wire fraud, mail fraud, tax evasion, video game pre-orders, loot boxes, limited edition Funko Pops, identity theft, corporate malfeasance, police impersonation, market manipulation, money laundering, running fraudulent educational institutions, and more. Don't delay! Enroll in Scam Likely School for Scammers today!